Coming up, the New York football Giants sign a young rookie running back that could be the answer inside of the backfield. We'll dive in on Dante Miller's story. We'll also take a look at the offensive line issues that you may not have realized were occurring a year ago and whether or not that impacts the top of the draft board. Plus, cornerback, critical. Have I found a name for Big Blue to keep an eye on? We dive in coming up next. Ah, uh, yes, my friends, it's OGP, the One Giant Podcast, where you know that we are your host over here, Adam Armbrecht, over there, Andrew Makowitz. We are healthy, wealthy, and wise on a Monday, ready to break down a few different areas for the New York football giants on offense and on defense, Andy. But 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 how are we as we ease into the week? You know, it, it's starting to turn. You can feel the spring weather in, in the New York, New Jersey area, Adam. It is like 66 degrees. It's going to be 70 degrees tomorrow. It finally feels like we're out of the throes of the cold weather and into the enjoyable time. In, well, in the you know what to do. Blame Andy when it snows at the end of the week. Yeah, listen, it does feel like we are. And, and then obviously with the draft coming up, then you start to think about the offseason program and getting bodies in there and into camp and start working out and teams forming what they're going to be. So obviously that kind of identifies with those spring and summertime vibes for the New York football giants. It's funny, man. We talk about Andy likes to wear that tinfoil hat sometimes. A lot of smoke screens. Don't know which way teams are going. Everyone's trying to give misinformation. At the end of last week, it was reported that the New York football giants might have an interest in a running back going into the draft class in Trey Benson out of Florida State. And you can go look over at his profile. We have his RAS score that we can throw up on the screen here along with Jalen Wright because we were talking about these guys. Hey, there's some things to really like there, right? The measurables, the height, the 40-yard dash, the split. All of these things with a 9.77 RAS score, you go, oh, okay. But I, I gave pause because I couldn't quite figure out. The Giants, the fourth best running back over on draft buzz. What is that? 70th pick overall? Maybe even needing to be higher in order to get a player like that. And then a funny thing happens, Andy, on the way to the draft. The New York football Giants don't pivot, but they go and bring in Dante Miller, who not only has a fun background, but also has a pretty clear path here maybe to being important for the Giants. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, a little peek behind the curtain before the show. I really wanted to talk a little bit about Dante Turbo Miller um, because oh. his story, his story is incredible, Adam. And also, he he helps fill a need in an area that the Giants desperately need help at. So it, yeah. it works both ways. But I just want, in case anyone's not familiar, Andy Staples wrote an unbelievable article on on 3com where he talked about um, Dante Miller's journey to being into getting to this point. You may look at it, and over the last, uh, you know, twelve to eighteen months or so, Dante Miller has had six carries for thirty-six yards in his college career, and you're like, okay, why would the Giants be signing a guy that is undrafted? How is he not drafted? How is he not even in this NFL draft? Like, what is going on that makes him available? And so, Adam, I'll give I'll give the cliff notes of okay. his story as quickly as I can, and then I would love to, you know, we'll, and we'll get into the importance of, of his play on the field, but. He grew up in Connecticut. Um, his mother dropped him off uh, at, at a cousin's house when he was two years old, and she never came back. And then he was in and out of foster care for a while. He worked as hard as he could at football to the point where, um, you know, many years later moved in um, with his aunt in, in uh, the Carolinas. Decided to, he wanted to be back up in the New York area and went to Columbia University where he was all Ivy League. He was awesome, amazing. And it happened during the COVID time where like they kind of lost a year, but he was a three-year starter. In the Ivy Leagues, you can only play four seasons in four years, mm -hmm. whereas every other major conference in Division One, you can play five you can play five seasons, especially with the COVID year of everything else going on. So he transfers to South Carolina, presumably for his last year, which is you know his his fourth season. He plays four games, and then he gets into this weird thing where he plays a total of 6.9 seconds and 18 seconds in the next two games. And, and the team is basically like, let's redshirt you. I know the rule is usually around four games, but let's redshirt you. Let's see if we get a waiver from the NCAA so you can play again. Well, they put the waiver together, and of course, the NCAA declines the waiver and says, in fact, he shouldn't be eligible at all because of the rules that were in the Ivy League versus this one. And so all of a sudden, he's too late for the NFL draft last year. He has no, he has nowhere to go, nothing to do. 
So after graduating from Columbia, he ends up getting his master's at South Carolina. And because the team felt so bad, Adam, they let him stay and practice with the team, be part of the team, work out, get exercise in, like make sure he stayed fit. But he couldn't play at all because he was ineligible to play this season. So the only time he had the ability to show up and show out for everyone was during South Carolina's pro day where he called in a favor and they said, yeah, sure. You know, you were on the team. Let, let come in and, and let's see what you've got. And Adam, unofficially, he ran a 4 2 7 40. Some people say it could have been as high as 4 3 5. Either way, that's incredibly fast. He also had 28 reps at 225 bench press. It would have been two more than the leader at the NFL Combine, which was Blake Corum. So he's got power. He's got speed. I think he's like 5'9", 200 pounds. His story is incredible. His journey of perseverance and never giving up is there. I, I, I just wanted to highlight it because it's a tremendous story for Turbo. And I really hope that he has an opportunity to make this roster. And I think he does based on what's going on with the team. Hey, get it right, buddy. It's little turbo. Okay. Don't don't leave off the little because he's five nine, two hundred pounds. And he packs a punch. Listen, no, it is. The background of it is great. The other <laughs> here's two parts of it. The background story is great to find a way to still have an opportunity potentially to have an NFL career for yourself. The other side of it is how stupid college is and the rules and the way they just can't navigate these things sometimes, right? Like you can't get so out of your silly. own way to be like, all right, Ivy League, not Ivy League. Kid wants to play football, even if it was within a year ago. So he can't play football at all after being trying to be redshirted because of some weird rule. And then, you know, it just doesn't make sense. You can't do either thing. And by the way, the NFL might be culpable in this too, because like, can we just let him get, get into the draft here? What's the difference? We all know who he is. We all know the stats. Here you go. And they go, ah, we'd love to, but <laughs> the paperwork, you know, the way that goes, it's the, what was that years ago? The classic tried to fax over the trade, but we didn't get there in time. It's like, what are we talking about here in, in modern NFL, you know, standards? Well, and, and, and in all this paperwork and craziness of rules, like you said, common sense, they should have been able to like ping someone at the NCAA office and be like, hey, do you think like we're going to get a, a, the year of eligibility back? Like he played like an extra 30 seconds. Like, can we, right, can right. we maybe use some common sense? Of course, they wait nine months to give him an answer on that, which is like the silliest thing on the planet. But because of that delay, Adam, he was already ineligible to play a after that. So he was supposed to be in last year's NFL draft. Right. But he didn't know because he was trying to still play college football. So what does that mean? He hires an agent to try to figure out if he can like get into this draft and where he could be selected and he goes to this pro day. And then they realize, oh, guess what? You're not eligible for this year's draft because you were eligible for last year's draft. So now you're a free agent on the open market and you can go wherever you want. And so that was actually an advantage for Dante Miller because he gets to pick his spot as opposed to just being drafted and, and going wherever. He had multiple teams that were interested. He did a workout with the Giants. And the Giants loved him, and they said, let's bring him in. He decided not only because he likes, he wanted to come back up to where he went to school at Columbia, but all you know, he has family and friends here, but also he sees the opportunity on the field around Devin Singletary and Eric Gray uh, as the only two running backs in the room with the departure of Saquon Barkley. Yeah, of course. And so just to uh, give a little extra there, when he's with the uh... – when he was at the, excuse me, Columbia, 2018 to 2021, rushed for over 1,200 yards on 258 carries, six touchdowns, including his career-long run, 83 yards, which was the sixth longest in school history. So he had success at Columbia, but remember, that's from 2018 to 2021. It's now 2024, and that's why you end up finding yourself having these conversations and interviews and trying to figure out what's possible for this team. And then you get to the New York football giants, and, and just to your point, listen, you have Singletary, you have Eric Gray. We know that you still have uh, Corbin there who's on the practice squad. Like the, the back end of what's going to happen here with the running back room is going to be interesting. And that's going to evolve for the Giants. And we're going to see it probably through the draft after the draft cuts around the league. Right. But if you are D Dante Miller, to your point, you walk in and go, OK, they just let their superstar walk in free agency. They drafted a late round running back a year ago and they brought in an experienced player but who is by no means regarded as the an elite talent who was a stalwart at the position. If I come in and I'm given reps in training camp it, it, for everything that I've gone through, I feel pretty confident that I can carve out a role for myself. Unlike other spots around the league, potentially last note on Dante Miller, Adam, it's interesting that he has a real legitimate chance of making this team and making an impact, especially on special teams because of the rule changes in the kickoff and the kick return. It's yeah, yeah. less about like a, just a, a specialist guy like an, a potentially Gunnar Olszewski or Isaiah McKenzie, they think of it more as a regular play where players need to find holes and space. 
And his mm-hmm. power and speed and vision at the running back position is tailor made to be a special teams guy accepting a kickoff. So not only does he have value in, in the, in the running back room, which is, is kind of still open for, for whoever's going to claim those spots, but really on special teams, he can really make a name for himself here with the giants. And that is interesting because Andy, once upon a time when the Giants signed a second potential returner this offseason, he said, I don't know what we're doing here. We only need one guy to take those kickoffs and punts. But maybe if it's Dante Miller and it means it gets some extra role here and you're right, because it's actually going to lead into talking about the offensive line play. But, but that factors into the special teams now because that's what it more is. It's more of a massive offensive line running play, whether you're going to use your wide receiver, a gadget guy or a traditional running back. Once that ball gets kicked off and the lines are that much closer, hey, get a hat on a hat, find some space, make some holes, and it does lend itself, you would think, to one of two types of players, running backs first and foremost, and then secondly, wide receivers that are used often on jet sweeps, end around plays, lining them up in the backfield, right, dual setbacks, splitting them out behind the quarterback. Like It's going to be really fun to watch the way any team, let alone the Giants, try to approach these. And, and certainly from an NFL standpoint, by the way, because we didn't spend a lot of time on this this offseason, it's going to make it more interesting. Nobody wants to see these kickoffs, and they made it punitive to kick the ball through the end zone now. So that's going to be a big change. We'll talk about that more this offseason. Now, we're talking about the offensive line. You had, you pulled this uh, inf- interesting information. I'm going to lose track of who to give credit for on it. We will in the show notes, though. And we'll also put up the link to the article in the show notes, too, because I think everyone should check out Miller's story along the way. When we talk about offensive line and we talk about the draft, we obviously, everyone's focus here is on Evan Neal and whether or not he's going to get a chance to compete at right tackle anymore. Then we get into a debate that I do want to briefly have here. But where the Giants struggled a year ago, as we throw it up over on YouTube, if you're watching, uh, sacks given up between tackles versus interior offensive line. It's going to be the blue and red there showing it. If you look over at the Giants, they're going to be third down from the left. And it's interesting to note that they are primarily struggling off the tackle position when it comes to their total sacks given up a year ago. Do you what do you prescribe this to? Because I find it a little bit in, I find it a little bit fascinating. And I think this is one of those things where uh, Daniel Smith, by the way, over on Twitter, as Andy helps me out in the background here, found that graphic, put it together. We know that the interior offensive line was the problem for the Giants. And this graph really speaks to exactly that point. So we, when we talk about the, the offensive tackle position, Evan Neal w- was was a challenge, obviously had yes. an up and down season. Andrew Thomas was injured for, you know, it got injured in the in the first series of, of, of the season. And so like, yeah, but if you look at the offensive tackle, it's kind of consistent. It's not, you wouldn't say that there's crazy outliers for the Giants above everyone else in the league. It's, it's relatively um, in the middle of what everyone else is doing. But the interior offensive line, you can tell that that was the biggest pain point for the Giants. Teams knew that they could, they could, the Giants could be had up the middle. You had a rookie center trying to get him, his feet underneath him. You were pulling guys like Justin Pugh literally right off the couch to be able to start and play impactful minutes. You had a revolving door of different guys, whether it's Glowinski, whether it's Zudu, it, it, it didn't matter. The Giants had no consistency, no continuity. Uh, JMS at the center position looked like he was a rookie and a little bit out of his depths. Would have been nice to have someone like a veteran leader that was at least replacement level next to him to help him out. But really, the Giants were being had at that at both guard and center positions up the middle. Really tough look when you think about how bad the offensive line has been. Yeah, and so the reason why I think it, it, it can be misleading, not that JMS wasn't going to struggle as a rookie, not that they didn't have talent, we know about Lewinsky and all that stuff on the inside. But to me, you mentioned about when Thomas gets injured, okay, who's replacing him? I don't know, somebody, but not someone you, you anticipated and certainly not someone that's going to be able to play consistently. Evan Neal struggles, right? What's going to happen with him? I don't know. We're trying to grind it out because we spent a top 10 draft pick on him. If you think that when defenses line up, that everybody that's playing and lining up over top of the tackles or lining up on their inside shoulders, they're not going, hey, you know what we need to do here? Kind of buck off the tackles, throw our bodies towards that middle, create disruption for our, our stunts and blitzes going up the gut, where, yes, they have an experience. Yes, they have average to below average play, right? So I think the compounding nature of what happens when you have an all bad offensive line overall is you pick your poison, right? And the best thing that you can do when you want to disrupt a quarterback is get pressure in their face immediately. If my if I'm trying to find the quickest route to the quarterback, it's not off the edge. When I have speed rushers, when I have guys that can bull rush the tackles, get them out of our way, and get downhill at the quarterback, that's great. 
But if you get pressure in the face of the quarterback, you flush them out of the quarterback, uh, out, of the, out of the pocket, excuse me, you blow up running plays that want to work between the tackles. They saw that time and again, Saquon Barkley getting that two, three yards behind the line of scrimmage. So I think it heightens a weakness there. But if I was looking at this graph, like in my mind, I would say watching all season long, you would go, right, outside of when Andrew Thomas is healthy and playing on the field, it's pretty much that the sack ability or where you're going to get pressured from, it's all relative because four-fifths of that offensive line was either young, inexperienced, or bad. And, and that's just the nature of what it is to be a bad offensive line. I think you could have flipped these numbers, and it wouldn't have shocked me one way or the other because, again, who were you pointing to and saying, oh, well, they're consistent beyond Andrew. Yeah, well, but, but the fact that Andrew was there for at least 12 to 13 games, yeah, yeah. expected tackle. Right, but then, and then you look. focus your attention on the right tackle, right. right? Because it doesn't matter. Like That's the problem. When you have so many holes on your offensive line, it ends up becoming like, okay, we only have to worry about one guy. Everybody go ahead and figure out this action on the other end. You don't have to overemphasize trying to beat Andrew Thomas. We can just walk right down the line whenever we want to. Well, and, and clearly Joe Shane saw this graphic and his team saw this graphic because in free agency, what did they do, Adam? They immediately addressed the guard position with Jermaine Illuminor and John Runyon Jr. So like they immediately went out and paid eight to $10 million on the open market to get guard help. They looked at that and said, we are struggling in the interior of our offensive line. We have to get better. We know, we hope and know that Andrew Thomas at left tackle is going to to be a pro bowl caliber, almost all pro level left tackle. So really if we're shoring up the guards and we hope that John Michael Schmidt progresses from being a rookie, you just look at Evan Neal and say, we need one more piece to fall into place for this to be better. And if not, I think the giants are going to address the offensive tackle position in the draft and at least get a swing tackle in there as insurance for Evan Neal. Okay. So here's the two things I'll talk about with that. Cause I think it's important to bring it up. Joshua Zudu as of right now gets listed behind Andrew Thomas as a left tackle currently. And this is one thing that I wanted to bring up because I think it's, I think it's important. We spent every, everyone has done this. Okay. Is Evan Neal still capable of playing right tackle? And if not, you kick him inside, you let him compete at guard. I don't know why that would be the assumption actually. Because to me, it's like saying, well, you failed there, so let's see if you can fail upward, and we're going to give you another spot to compete at. Now, backup role, certainly. But I can actually paint the picture, like, why is Illuminor here? He has some of that experience. It's like, hey, Illuminor is going to be maybe the one-to-one. -one. If Evan Neal cannot keep that role and he's going to lose it, Illuminor is going to be the guy that takes over there. Now, I want to talk about the draft, but like that is going to be the thing to watch here in this offseason for me. And then I don't know what happens with Evan Neal. I don't think the assumption can be, well, you'll kick him inside and he'll start to compete for right guard, you know, for a right guard starting role. Maybe he does. But do you think that Evan Neal is going to kick inside and become competitive enough to overtake John Runyon? Now we can ask about McCaithen and where he's going to be in this. You can think about the left guard spot, but now you're going down the line here. Okay, so now Evan Neal, who is not good enough and fails at right tackle, can't go play right guard because you have a player that you believe is better than him. Now you're going to flip him over the other side of the offensive line and start to get him reps there. Like, I just think I should be opened up here to the reality. There is a world where if Evan Neal fails to win and maintain his role at the right tackle spot, that's going to be kind of the end of the road for him in any significant capacity for the Giants. You know what I always like to say is, one, follow the money. And two is like, let's just see what their play was on the field. Jermaine Illuminor signed a two-year, $14 million deal to yeah, come to the Illuminor Giants, and they have him as a backup yeah, right now. Yeah. What, what, are, what are we talking about? Yeah. Aaron Stinney signed a one-year, $1.2 million deal. Like, okay, that sounds like the backup money. And then right. when you look at, like, you know, very basic numbers from Pro Football Focus, Illuminor had a 68.5, and Aaron Stinney had a 56.6. 56. Yeah. So, like, not only is Illuminor getting like five five times the amount of money, but he also played better on the field according to you know Pro Football Focus and maybe some other metrics. So for me, I look at this and I'm like, it's more confusing than anything. Maybe they don't understand that John Runyon Jr. and Illuminor are going to play the guard spots, and the Giants continue to say that Evan Neal will have the opportunity right away to stay at the right tackle. Like, how does anything else make sense? I could care. Well, I could care. Yeah, I could, the Giants. I could care less about the the ESPN, you know, confusion of their depth chart. But I, but I, 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 I don't. I, you talk about smoke. This is giant smoke here. Evan Neal's gonna have every uh, great, like he is. But guess what? The second that you get into camp, like they're gonna know very early on here. And maybe, and Evan Neal can do it. I'm not saying that like it's you know we're gonna walk into camp here and say why bother wasting the reps on Evan Neal. Illuminor, you mentioned the contract. 
He is not there just to sh- just to shore up the guard spot here for the New York Football Giants. He is there if Evan Neal fails. He is there to take on that role, unless, and this is what I want to get to. We've gone through these drafts so much, and there's already more information. This is not knocking Malik neighbors, but whether or not personality fit these kind of things, right? Some teams like a little bit of fire in their wide receiver, that passion. I don't think that the Giants are really in that spot. It's why we keep kind of elevating a Dunze as being the target for the New York football Giants. But when you go and run some of these mocks, there are worlds. And by the way, even a couple of them where I saw the Arizona Cardinals take a Dunze at four, which was pretty upsetting for me, where the Giants come up at six and Joe Alt is still there. And I think that we may be collectively as a fan base and as people covering this team, getting a little far afield on the automatic. You want to get that weapon. These are elite talents. If Joe Walt is there at six, I'll I'll, I'll ask you the question. I won't tell you the answer. Do you think that it would be a smart move for the Giants to bookend their tackles, put Illuminor at a guard spot, have Runyon at a guard spot and their rookie now second year center in the middle of that line and say, guess what? We just cemented our offensive line for this year. And now three fifths of our line, we think is ready to roll for the next decade to come. I mean, Joe Alt is a great player, Adam, but I just, it, it's, it's the balance of wanting them to fix the line once and for all but also making sure that we allocate resources to the team accordingly. And like, you're not wrong with the, so you don't care screen. about offensive line play. I got it. Uh, well, it, it, I, I feel like they have done a lot to address it. And at some point we need the coaches to be able to coach them up. And that's why Carmen Brasillo is now the offensive line coach of the giants. Like, you have Andrew Thomas as a first round pick. You have John Michael, Michael Schmitz, who is a high pick. You have Evan Neal that was a top 10 pick. You have two guards that you just went out in free agency and spent money on. You have other guys that you drafted in the mid third and fourth rounds. At some point, you got to say, figure it out, guys. Figure it out. But to your point, Adam, it's actually not that far fetched for Joe All to be in the conversation. I know that that's a great buzzword. But right now, if you go on FanDuel, for instance, the number yeah. six pick is where the Giants pick. We talked about it before. Malik Neighbors uh, is is the odds on favor to be drafted there. Odds have shifted to bring Roma Dunze closer to him since we last had this discussion. Mm-hmm. But tied for third is J.J. McCarthy and Joe All. They are tied as the next likely after taking a wide receiver. And whether that's the Giants trade out because someone wants a tackle or whether the Giants would actually address it. I mean, you're not wrong. I mean, if the Giants are going to build this thing and say we're going to build in the trenches, we want to get two bookend tackles for the next 10 years, and it, that will solve our run game problem and give Daniel Jones more time or whatever quarterback we have, it's another avenue that the Giants would could take. I personally wouldn't want them to do that. I really think that Roma Dunze is a guy that I've kind of sold myself on at, at this point uh, of being a New York Giant, but it just shows that there is more than one way to build this roster. Yeah, and you can't listen. Like, and this is the hard part about it too. You know, is Joe Walt a generational tackle, right? You know, and, and and in a lot of ways, he gets regarded as that, right? This is a guy that you're going to bring in to whatever percentage you can say. He's not going to be a miss, right? He's going to be a high-end talent for you. He's going to be in the vein of an Andrew Thomas as opposed to an Evan Neal, right? <laughs> on this spectrum that the Giants have right in front of them. So there's that, there's that part of it. And then on the wide receiver side, if you're talking about, well, Adunze, is he is he an incredible talent? Yes. Is he a generational talent that position? Well, that's a question. And then the other thing you have to look at is, and where are we if the Giants say, there's no tradeback opportunities, no trade-ups, we're not going for quarterback, and we're going to get ourselves into a situation where it's either we're taking a Dunze or maybe we're taking Joe Alt. When you fast forward into the second round, I mentioned this player going back to the start of the offseason, essentially, when we start to look at some of these players. Jordan Morgan out of Arizona, okay. Is he an offensive tackle prospect? Maybe he's going to kick into guard that you want to look at. Go a little bit further down to Cedric Beebe, right? You can look at him there. Now you're getting into like the 50s kind of range. And if you want to bring in extra help in the long term around the offensive line and on that interior there, then you're kind of asking those questions. Now, the offensive line prospects overall, it's regarded as being a fairly deep class. So maybe it can be 70, maybe it can be 107. The interesting thing here is, and I think that becomes fascinating about the offseason too, you bring in a new coach, you want to get this thing cleaned up. So now we come back to the team and back to the current players. So what is Marcus McCaithen? 
What is Joshua Zudu, right? If we're going to sit here and say Evan Neal has a chance to turn it around, and he's a high first-round pick, obviously, so expectations are higher, but what have these other players shown or not shown, right? It's been a little bit of a longer road. They're middle-round picks, but they are players that the Giants and Joe Shane seem to want to go get, Zudu specifically. So I think this training camp, and obviously the draft will inform us here, but if you get to training camp and the Giants don't add any critical pieces at a high level on the offensive line, I'm talking first, second, third round, then I think you take the step back and you say, well, they believe that our developmental process was pretty much absolutely disastrous over the last couple of seasons. And if we get it back on track, we can still think of the draft capital we've invested in certain players and believe that they can get there. So maybe two years from now, we are talking about Azudu or McKathan being in the mix there. John Michael Schmitz, obviously. Does Evan Neal recover or not? TBD. But that's why you bring in the veteran Band-Aids, because we actually think we might have the in-house solutions. We just need a little bit more time to get them up to speed and where we want them to be. Yeah, I mean, listen, Adam, some of these offensive linemen that have been drafted relatively high, there's a lot of guys in the mix, either are evaluation of talent at the offensive line has been incorrect or misguided or the coaching has not been uh, good enough to be able to coach these players up to get the most out of their talent. Obviously Joe Shane's going to point to the coaching rather than the evaluation because he's he on me, buddy. responsible for the evaluation. Right. But I'm crushing but, it. <laughs> but I mean, that's, that's what he's hanging his hat on. He's like, we did the work. We know these guys are capable of playing. We need someone to get the most out of them to be able to fulfill where we got them in the draft. But this is why it's so hard. I mean, a fourth round draft pick at the offensive line, you don't know if it's going to work, but you hope that they can at least be a serviceable player that can come in in a pinch. And right now the Giants are, are struggling to figure that out. As you mentioned, Carmen Brasillo coming over from Oakland. He's got a good opportunity to really turn this around and, and be a folklore hero with Giant fans knowing how bad things have been on the offensive line position. Yeah, and I think for that, that's why I bring it up only because what will we be disappointed in, right? You come in. You're watching the games unfold week one, week two, and you see whether it's Evan Neal or anybody getting absolutely destroyed off the right side, whatever quarterback is under center, getting absolutely pummeled, and Roma Dunze is going downfield, hand up in the air, I'm ready for the pass, and no ball is coming, right? Now, again, that's only one-fifth of your offensive line play, but this, that's, what, that's what's so critical about this draft class, so critical about this offseason is the Giants need to, it's not about fixing everything across the board, just about setting a better baseline here. A little more time means a little more route development, means a little more explosive plays, and all of a sudden you find yourself competing. We'll talk about the other wide receiver options. You get the second and third rounds. We've mentioned Leggett before, but there's even some other names that I do find pretty interesting, including one that would be attached to a J.J. McCarthy coming out of Michigan because, hey, QB play impacts wide receiver play and how they're able to put together some really good tape ahead of the draft. One other note that I'll just make here because we have it up on the board. We're going to go more uh, in-depth on this as well. Cornerback is obviously a big factor for the New York football giants. And when you go down this list here, there have been players that we've talked about before, obviously top of the draft guys that, you know, you talk about Mitchell and talk about Arnold. doesn't seem like that's going to be in the cards for Big Blue. We have yet to paint a picture, even in a trade-down scenario, or maybe that'd be the route that the Giants will go, but we'll explore it. Um, Rake Straw is another guy high up on the board that I'm not in, not too interested in. You liked Lassiter, mentioned him. We talked about DJ James and his kind of raw talent. But I kept going through this. Uh, Max Melton had a local product out of Rutgers, like him too. I ended up coming across, at least interestingly enough, and why I find it interesting is because I had to go a ways. Over on Draft Buzz, you just keep going down the list, looking through some of these other names, all the way into mid-rounds, talking about a guy like King out of Penn State. But I ended up coming back to Renardo Green, excuse me, out of Florida State. And you go watch his tape and you go look at his measurables and you check out the RAS score. It's like all these little elements work pretty darn well to give you a cornerback that plays an aggressive style of football that you would have concerns about maybe some penalties getting a little too handsy. But if you want a tough nose player in run support that seems to be instinctual getting down at the line of scrimmage, he's there and available. Yeah, oh, I mean, Renardo Green is an interesting one, Adam. Obviously, um, he's six foot tall, so he's got the size. He's got some of the measurables. He runs fast enough to, to be capable. He right. has versatility. What I find fascinating is he has versatility inside uh, and outside at the cornerback position, but also NFL draft was, has him listed as a safety. And I find that fascinating because we, when we talk about you know, Xavier McKinney leaving, who's going to be filling that role? We've got a couple different players that we've brought in. Jalen Mills comes to mind. You have Dane Belton, Jason Pinnock. Is there another guy in the mix? How is Shane Bowen's defense going to look if we just have a whole lot of 
defensive back secondary guys and you don't necessarily know who's going to play where does someone like Renardo green provide that flexibility it's an interesting one for the giants to consider for sure yeah fourth on the list there at the safety position um a guy like you know cooper DeGene out of iowa like that's one that i've been watching too because he still gets listed a cornerback but a lot of places say maybe safety will be his better long-term role there so there's certainly something to watch here it's a 4 4 9 40 as andy mentions which is always going to just from a defensive back Hey, we're going to go ahead and categorize my speed first, and then we'll worry about some of the details. So we'll get into that more. I just want to start to throw out these names every single day, every single episode, another prospect to watch here, because as we look through the first, second, third, fourth rounds, and even into the back end, there's going to be, there's going to be different decisions to make. And it only takes, if you go with Dunze at six, well, now how does it impact second, third, and fourth rounds? If you went Joe Alt, well, obviously flip the script. Now wide receiver becomes priority number one getting into round two. So all these things become fascinating to me. But I said at the top, maybe the Giants solved one of their subplot problems here by getting a player like Dante Miller. Incredible story, certainly has upside, and is going to have every opportunity to come in and claim a role for himself. And that's probably the best that you can ask for ahead of the draft. If you're making margin signings in free agency, let's have them be players that have a skill set, a talent, and a position that the Giants can improve at if they shine. We will continue to talk about all of these narratives throughout the week, including fleshing out cornerback, wide receiver, offensive lineman. I'll, I'll demand that Andy give me a mid-round player to bring in here because we know we're going to need more of that depth as well and other positions of need. And to follow us on that journey, get over to uh, YouTube. Follow us at One Giant Podcast. Get over to X at Andy Mac 214 at Adam Armbrecht and at One Giant Podcast. Until next time, as Andrew Mack would want, need, and nay, demand the people know. As always, let's go big blue. Oh,